It's today it's the 2022 uh, CTII uh, Student Awards. And the way we're gonna be running that today is uh, we're gonna have three different um, slots. The first slot will be about the best uh, master thesis award. We're gonna tell you about the process, but most and foremost, we're gonna have the three uh, finalists pitching us their research. And after we're gonna have, and we have with us uh, the winner of uh, last year award that's gonna tell us a little bit about her research as well, while the, um, the jury deliberates and after uh, tell us the, the winner of this year's edition. Then after we're gonna have a second part that's gonna be about the best uh, entrepreneurship project awards. And we'll be doing uh, more or less the same approach. So we're gonna tell you about the selection process. Then we're gonna have three teams pitching. And then we're gonna have with us uh, this year, we're gonna have uh, Raquel from Mango Up that's gonna tell us about her project that won uh, last year. Then the last, but the not least uh, uh, slot for today, will be about the, the forward pre-acceleration program. And again, we'll tell you about the, the selection process. We're gonna have the three finalists pitching, and then we're gonna have the jury uh, selecting um, the, the winner. Okay, so it's gonna be a threefold agenda today. Um, saying that, uh, I'd like to pass on to Professor Selina Bekasis Moedesh, the founder and the academic director of the center. Thank you, Pierre. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's good to see everybody around. I mean, I know you're not all in Lisbon. I've even heard that some of you are in exotic places, meaning outside of Lisbon. Um, I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank particularly uh, Carla Rocha, who's, you know, I, I think everybody knows because uh, she's been involved in the process of the master's uh, from beginning, beginning to end. So I'm, I'm sure it's, I mean, for us, it's a great pleasure to have you here, Carla. And I'm sure it's interesting for you to see, you know, what comes after the life of the defense of a thesis. So, you know, that's what happens. I also want to thank Jose Vasconcelos for his presence here because he's, uh, he's been involved for, um, in, in, the, in the thesis, but particularly on the, on the um, entrepreneurship project. And then just to say that um, the, the center is sponsored by the Patrick and Lina Drahi Foundation, and it has a few uh, uh, missions. One is to um, uh, sponsor research in the area of uh, innovation and entrepreneurship, and it has over the years supported the research of uh, three researchers and one postdoc uh, here present, uh, Professor Lolliglis. It sponsors courses in the area of uh, innovation and entrepreneurship as the one in, in design thinking that some of you have uh, uh, participated to. And then the dissemination of knowledge, which is uh, you know, what we're doing through different events, like what we're, we're doing now. And last but not least, and clearly very important to the mission of the center, is the link with the entrepreneurship uh, ecosystem in, in Lisbon. So uh, we are partners with Startup Lisboa. And the third part of this event is about the forward, the pre-acceleration program, which, um, which aims at bridging the, the, the student world with the uh, world of uh, acceleration and incubators. And um, uh, it is the second edition, and I would say a few words about that later, but basically we, you know, we're very proud because the, 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 the project that won the first edition won many different and, and much more uh, prestigious awards than ours, which means that you know, somehow we're doing our role of, of you know, at a small scale, you know, um, um, finding the right project that are probably the ones that are gonna, are gonna make it and, and, uh, and have a life afterwards. So regarding uh, the first part today, we're gonna work on, on the, on the um, award for the best thesis as, as uh, you know, at least three or four of you here, I know have been involved in the thesis, you know, it's a long and, and sometimes difficult process, but it's also a very rich and interesting process. So I am proud that we can give a, a, a life afterwards to this, uh, to those uh, thesis, and that you know some some of you are going to win the award, and that, that at least some of you are going to give visibility to their work, 
which is not always the case. And uh, you know, I want to say that uh, I want to commit in the future that we should have give more visibility to the very interesting works that are done throughout the, the thesis. So thank you all. Good luck to the three finalists and uh, let it begin. Thanks for the transition. So now we're starting the best master thesis awards. So how, how did that work? So every year we have more than hundreds of theses that are defended, okay? And for the students, it's the opportunity actually to close their, their work at, uh, at Catholica with, um, with having this thesis, thesis and the work done with that and sharing it you know, uh, with the jury at the end. So what we did is basically um, the center looked and asked actually to have uh, access at the 329 theses. So we looked at the title, the grade, and also, you know, uh, what they were involved with. And the jury that is here uh, looked at this and selected a uh, few theses, the ones that were linked to the center, so linked to entrepreneurship, technological innovation, et cetera. We also looked at the grade. So we selected all the theses in this group of theses, entrepreneurship, technological innovation, et cetera, that had more than 17. And then the jury did a short list on that. And after we had access to uh, the full thesis and we did some review on the full thesis and we selected uh, a top three. So uh, it was quite a lot of work to, to go through uh, at the end to read the thesis and select uh, the one that will be presented today. Um, and today the jury that will be listening or gauging your, your, your presentation will be Celine Gerald is excused. He had to actually attend some thesis today. So last minute, he will not be able to make it. And then we're gonna have uh, Professor Laws, Law Leglise that is also part of this jury, okay? So that's gonna be the jury members that will listen to the finalists. And who are the finalists? So the finalists are ta -ta 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 -ta, these three persons here. So we have first by alphabetical order, Okay, so we have Amelie. Amelie is here with us through Zoom. She's in an exotic location, I think in South America. Thank you for being here today with us. And uh, Amelie will share with us a research about uh, you know, uh, the work that she did with René Bronsnac. Then after we're gonna have Leticia. Leticia is here with us today in uh, a work with uh, Professor Lohr on the fashion industry. And then uh, we will have Simon that uh, worked with um, um, uh, his advisor, Jose Vachconcelos, and uh, uh, we'll hear the three of you. So before we start, you all guys will have three minutes pitching and I will look at the time, okay? I will share the presentation from Amelie at the beginning because she didn't have her slide and she's far away, but both Leticia and Simon will have the hand on their presentations. So they can move it, okay? Um, the winner of this uh, award will receive um, a 500 euro prize. And after I'll get in touch with, with the winner. So let's get, the show begin. I'll put the slide uh, here from um, Amelie. Amelie, the floor is yours. I'll put three Thank minutes. You. Thank you, Pierre. So um, as Pierre already said, I would like to introduce you how companies can overcome one of the most pressuring problems that um, we have today and push sustainable technologies to the mass market. Next slide, please. Due to increasing effects of global warming, sustainability is on the top of the agenda for companies and politicians. Recently, the World Economic Forum published three imperatives to accelerate sustainable recovery. 
leveraging sustainable technology to transform economies, which is the focus of my thesis, tops this list. Next slide, please. So the main issue is that sustainable technologies fail to reach the mass market because of market attractiveness and customer acceptance, which results in an immense challenge for companies. And my literature review show that the right business models are key for market penetration for sustainable technologies. And the existing literature, there was no comprehensive framework showing how companies can build up their competitive strategy to overcome commercialization challenges. Next slide, please. So I was building up a framework and to build and validate the framework, the qualitative monomer thought was used and seven, um, 11 semi-structured interviews conducted with CEOs, heads of strategy and the like of SMEs, as well as experts from the energy industry. And uh, to ensure consistency across these interviews, um, I structured the data using a coding guide in the software Max QDA. Next slide, please. So from that, you can see um, my main finding, um, the validated framework. So let me quickly walk uh, you through it because it's uh, very complex. Um, on the left side, you see the identified challenges which are how we can address to over, um, which can be addressed by overarching tactics. These tactics entail several business model patterns to that equip companies with an easy to follow guide. Next slide, please. Now let me quickly uh, illustrate the framework by using a concrete example. So let's have a look at the solar panel market. The main challenge is an unattractive customer journey. Customer prefer an easy process from planning the system over a recurring service and preferably uh, a one-stop shop fashion. So confirmed by several interviews, the simplifying tactic should be applied to address these challenge. Um, so par particularly solicitation of sustainable technologies would be a suitable pattern. For instance, companies should alter their commercial strategy by taking over the entire process, including planning permits, maintenance, enabling customers a very free usage. So Can thank you, you very much. <laughs> okay, excellent. Thanks. Thank you very much. It's uh, really difficult to um, have present uh, such a uh, complicated and um, yeah, thesis in three minutes, but thank you. But you did it, so excellent. <laughs> thank you very thank much, you. Emily. Please stay with us until uh, the end of this slot. Number two, we're going to um, pass on, on to Leticia. Leticia, do you want to share with us your research in the slides? I see your slides. Excellent. And after you tell me when I can start. Sorry. Um, yeah. uh, you can start. Excellent. So good afternoon. My thesis is the unsustainability of fashion industry, fashion on demand as a solution. In order to do so, I conducted a qualitative research and I use a comparative multi-case study featuring two Portuguese fashion brands, Constance Intrudo and Campus Store, uh, that add sustainability as a core value and that use the on-demand business model. Uh, fashion industry is a, a, a really valuable industry accounting for 2% of world's GPD, but it's also one of the most polluting industries. So in the last few years, we have seen like growing pressure for sustainability from several stakeholders, and they are now emerging innovative, sustainable and circular business models. Uh, the on-demand business model is one of them, and it can be defined as like pieces are exclusively produced when or as required. It, it's also a result of a shift in fashion where trends and products are based on consumer demand. And also the pandemic situation really helped since the consumer demand and behavior changed and big brands such as Zarevo, who and Asus has adopted this model 
or start producing smaller batches. In terms of the main findings of my thesis about adopting sustainability within fashion, uh, fashion brand, it is indeed a complex concept for all stakeholders. Uh, neither of the brands promote sustainability, though it's the core, the core business, uh, the core value, sorry, of their business. It may translate in different and possible conflicting practices and business models. Uh, there is no one size fits all, and it is a long process that involves trade-offs and changes throughout. Uh, there's also uh, increasing sustainability awareness from customers, but most of, most of them are not willing to pay extra for, for that sustainability and the cost that, that, that they have. Uh, regarding on-demand, business models, all components of the business must be adapted in order to adopt this business model. It also puts the fashion brands more vulnerable to the consumer's demand. It decreases sales volume and increases prices that could lead to financial and sustainability. Uh, the manufacturing process and logistics are the main challenge, challenge because it requires flexible partners uh, regarding quantities and prices. Uh, it also requires a huge investment in communication uh, to communicate with the customers, the business model specificities and waiting time to avoid complaints and origin can cancellations. And to optimize this model, the brand should own their production means or have great control over it. Uh, that's it. Thank you so much. Wow. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Patricia. Just in time. Thanks. Can we pass on to Simon? Simon, are you here? Yes, yes, I am here. Can you hear me clearly? Yeah, we see All you right. clearly as well, so it's fine. Perfect. <laughs> awesome. So I'll, I'll share my screen here. If yeah. you could just confirm that you can see it. Yeah. And it's that you blue. can see my slides. Yeah, it's blue. All right, perfect. So I'll begin now, if that's okay. Yeah, okay, you start. All right, so good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for allowing me to present my research to you today. I'd like to begin by stating the following, that startups fail and that they fail a lot. As many as nine out of every 10 will not survive their first years. This research focuses mainly on a very specific strategy device to reduce this rate of failure, the startup accelerator. And it analyzes the impact of acceleration program design variables on startup success metrics through a very comprehensive quantitative statistical analysis to answer the following question. How can we build a successful acceleration program? Quote et al. conducted a study in the context of US acceleration, which sets the stage for our research. Their data set has information on over 100 accelerators and close to 6,000 startups, which they surveyed and interviewed. To find this amount of data for the European ecosystem, we established partners, partnerships with two providers, Crunchbase and F-Success, and we were given unrestricted access to the largest and most renowned data aggregators for information on investments and startups. From there, we've developed algorithms for programmatic access and for data collection, significantly increasing the speed at which we were able to access and process this information. Automatic processes were complemented by interviews with program managers and many and many hours of searching through news articles, websites, and the web archive. We ended up with a complete data set of more than 200 accelerators and almost 5,000 startups, which rivals the American data set. Through the analysis of this data, we confirmed that the design of accelerator, acceleration programs, sorry, so the, the duration, their partners, and other key metrics does impact the success of startups. We were also capable of proposing the ideal structure for an accelerator, so one which maximizes its uh, chances of success. And we found that startups that go through programs structured in this manner had consistently higher valuations and raised more money. This research was conducted with reproducibility in mind, so that we can now rerun our models with new information and keep up with changes to the ecosystem. All of the code for the algorithms and collected data is available online for other researchers and managers to review and to analyze, which you can find by visiting the link in this slide. For years, entrepreneurs, founders, and VCs have been trying to come up with ways to aid startups to achieve their goals, accelerate their growth, and their market fit. That's the real impact of this research. It's the first European study with a relevant sample that can help managers increase their chances of success and the range of impact of their acceleration programs. I'm currently heading strategies and operations here at Nest Collective, where a tech hub and startup incubator in Cuba, right in the center of Portugal. We feel like Europe is closing in on the USA's leads in terms of growth and investment, and that it has achieved record levels for both in 2021. We agree that this is the right time to prepare for the future. And so we are currently raising 12 and a half million euros to support and invest 
in over 50 startups through an acceleration program and venture capital initiative based on the findings of this research, partnering with key players in the Portuguese, European, and American ecosystems. I firmly believe that analytical methodologies will give us the edge that we need to win the startup game. Thank you so much. Well, just in time. Thanks, thanks, Simon. So thank you all. I'd like to thank Amelie, Leticia, and Simon. Thank you guys. Stay with us a little bit more. But now, so I'm gonna, what I will be doing, I'll be um, inviting uh, uh, Luisa. So Luisa, I think you have a challenge in hands. Um, you gonna share with us now you were in the shoes of the winner last year, and we would like to hear a little bit about you. So you did the same thing. You were selected as a, a finalist of the thesis. So we'd love to hear about you, uh, about your research, and about who is Luisa and what happened since Luisa actually uh, won the award uh, last uh, last year. Okay, so uh, Luisa, the floor is yours. Sorry, Pierre, yeah. sorry to interrupt. Can you create the breakout room yeah. so that we can... You should receive that. Yeah, okay. thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. I hope it all worked out. Thanks for the introduction, Pierre. So, <laughs> so the challenge is I yours. Have, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I have seven to, to eight minutes, as Pierre told me, and I'm going to try to wrap it up uh, as good as I can. So once more, thank you again for having me. Uh, I'm really happy to, to see the finalists of this year's award. Uh, very exciting and I still feel very, very honored and very grateful having received the award last year. Such a great experience actually. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna start to, to properly introduce myself to you guys. So I started uh, my master's at Catolica in 2019. Uh, which is already three years ago by now, time really flies. And um, I then defended my thesis in January 2021, so almost one and a half years ago by now. And uh, during the master's, which I did in management, I had my focus on um, strategy and entrepreneurship. And uh, I did them like um, one year after finishing my bachelor's in Hamburg, in Germany, which is where I'm originally from and uh, then decided to discover some more sunny parts of Europe, uh, which is why I ended up in Lisbon. And uh, yeah, during the, during the masters, I started to focus more on entrepreneurship since I found this a very yeah, engaging and exciting topic. Also, since um, yeah, so much started to happen slowly but surely with the startup world in uh, Europe as well. And uh, as I started to focus on that, also had the uh, entrepreneurship project in the second semester, I yeah, kind of decided, so to speak, uh, to, to, to write the thesis also in that field. And I uh, fortunately found a topic that was and still is really of interest to me. Um, so I wrote about uh, female entrepreneurship and tried to find out whether culture actually has an impact on uh, well the attention of women to become an entrepreneur trying to shed a light on whether policies that are in place right now uh, or back then um, two years ago nearly uh, are really pushing the right buttons to, to also help women uh, become founders and with that seeing uh, both yeah, Simao and Emily also working on, well, at least small, medium sized and also startups uh, on their thesis. Um, yeah, that makes me really happy to see some pro progress there. Also, my one of my colleagues was also working on accelerator programs uh, and his thesis. So nice to see someone picking up the topic again. And uh, yeah, back to what I was writing about. So uh, the topic was so interesting to me because I kind of, um, yeah, discovered the, the info that uh, there's only 15% of female entrepreneurs in Germany. Uh, and even in a country that's economically this strong, this well developed, I, I would say, um, there seem to be big barriers. And if you take that step further, um, they also obviously, as I think that's a well known fact by now, get much less funding and, uh, well, just generally have a harder time. So I tried to dig deeper on that and try to understand why that's still in, well, back then, 2020 is such a big challenge. 
and um, yeah, try to find out what we can do or the, the policymakers can do to change it. Maybe we need something like the quota as well here to, to finally help jumpstart women in, in entrepreneurship. And um, yeah, I then dig deeper in, in, into theory and uh, there was already a lot of research on um, yeah, policies that are in place. Uh, and then I started to ask myself the question, okay, but why aren't they working? Is there something else? Are they missing out on something? Um, do we need to adapt these policies to, to more details? Are they pushing the right buttons in the different countries? And this is how I um, yeah, came up with the idea of integrating the cultural part as well and try to find out then, okay, uh, we know women have to overcome different barriers than men when trying to become startup founders but um, are these barriers that they have to become different in all european countries so um, does a woman in germany need to overcome a different barrier than a woman in portugal um, and do policymakers need to adapt that accordingly and well i actually found out that um, some cases yes and some cases no they need to adapt it some are pretty much the same barriers others are very specific to the culture and i work with well-known cultural models that uh, would now just bore you but uh, to give you some examples i found out that for example uh, investing in networks in germany and uh, simply giving women more chances to be well connected and have have a network in, in business can already make a big difference and help them overcome the barriers to, to become a founder. And for example, in Portugal, for Portugal, I found out that role models play a very big role. And once that see women, once women see that there are opportunities to, to become an entrepreneur, they actually tend to overcome the barriers and use these opportunities. And that role models even push um, this yeah, this happening even further. Um, so then these two uh, examples are just implications that I then ended up having in, in my thesis to maybe help policymakers make uh, their policies even more effective. And um, yeah, this is uh, as much about my thesis as I can tell you of right now, but um, I also then, since I was so yeah, knee deep into that topic, um, kind of stick to it and uh, Pierre also asked me to, to talk about what I'm doing today a little and uh, funny enough uh, I actually started working in a female founded startup and uh, yeah been working there for one and a half years already um, trying to modernize um, female health in, in the terms of maternity care and it's actually a lot of fun. So I hope that you guys maybe also, and I see CMO is already working in an accelerator profiting from his thesis, uh, can actually use it um, as a gain for your yeah, future endeavors. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you Excellent. enjoyed it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. We've gone uh, interesting. I, I remember a little bit about your research, but not uh, all the details. And especially congratulations for uh, for having this new role actually and impacting the health of the women uh, it's interesting so congrats um we should congratulations have... louisa and, and thank you and um, let me um uh, take advantage to advertise our next event so as you you know uh, <laughs> as i'm sure you've heard from me we're very proud that we have this uh, initiative called the women entrepreneurship award which you know is very re much related to what louisa just discussed and uh, because of that, we created this, 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 you know, this award because there's so much limitation for women entrepreneurs. We wanted to create uh, a, a, a pipe of role models for young women. So this is going to be the fourth edition of the Women Entrepreneurship Award. The ceremony is going to be on Friday, um, the, on July 1st at 6 p.m. And, uh, you know, you are all invited. Uh, Pierre, the, the the link will be on social media on the social media of the of the center, right? Yeah, it's already there. Yeah, if you want. It's already to there, so you know we're 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 counting on you. So thank you and congratulations, Louisa. It's a, it's always nice to to see the alumni in in all the formats that that exist. And now, without further ado, I'm sure you want to know uh, which one of the three um, um, finalists won. So first, you know. 
congratulations, congratulations to all three. Uh, very different topics, all related to the topic of the center, technology, um, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Very hard decision, but the uh, jury decided that Simon Nogueira was uh, the winning work. So, Simon, congratulations. Congrats. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Celine. Thank you so much, Pierre. Uh, thank you, CTIE. It's, it's, uh, it's an honor, <laughs> really, to be rewarded with this, with this award. There's, there's lots of hours put into this research, uh, lots, of, lots of time uh, working on, on this topic. And, and really, I think the, the outcome of the research can have a, a deep impact in the understanding of what, what is behind acceleration. And not just for investors and, and VC, of course, they're all interested in, in the topic as well, but, but for startups themselves, how they can choose the best program to sign up for and to take part in. Thank you as well to Professor Joseph Ashmanselsch without his guidance during the, the, the writing of the dissertation. Nothing would have been uh, as easy as it, as it ended up uh, uh, becoming. Uh, and again, thank you everyone for, for the recognition. So congratulations, Simon, and you know, you know what uh, to expect for next year, right? You're go probably gonna be <laughs> invited to come and present so you can start preparing for that. I, I will, I will. And, and hopefully with some good news from our program here at Est, something to share by then. Good. Thank you all, congratulations. Thank you all three finalists. You know, it was great to have you here. And um, I pass it on to Pierre because you know, the, the, the schedule is pretty tight. There's a lot going on. Okay, so again, thank you, Amelie. Thank you, Leticia. Thank you, Simon. And thank you, Louisa. All of you uh, deserve a big round of applause. So thank you very much. Um, and we're going to pass now to the second part of the day or the afternoon, which is about the best ma ma master entrepreneurship project award. So how it's going to work, uh, you know, at the school, if you look year over years, you have a number of startups that actually make it uh, to the market. And this is what we want to do actually with this award. We want to perhaps pick some of these startups that were started in some of these classes that you guys have, especially uh, during your master. And we ask your teaching team to send us recommendation or to filter some of these ventures that you did. And these ventures were reviewed uh, by, um, by uh, the, the, the following people. So we had uh, at the beginning, Celine, Geraldo and, and Lord that look at, at that and recommended the three. But today, the jury will be uh, from Celine. Geraldo, as I mentioned, was excused. And we're lucky to have with us, because I know that Marta is very, very busy, and it's an honor to have you with us today, Marta. Marta is the head of program for Startup Lisboa. A lot, a lot, a lot of experience in the startup world and a lot of programs and a lot of impact in the entrepreneurship ecosystem in Lisbon, but also in Portugal. So Marta, it's a privilege to have us with to have you with us today, okay? Thank you, Marta. Thank you very much, Marta. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. And um, the three finalists are Acacia, Movizi, and Shared Gear. So what this guy is going to be doing, they're going to have three minutes to pitch. You're going to have two minutes Q&A. So two minutes Q&A is about one question. And then after, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to have with us Raquel, sent from mango up uh, she's going to tell us about her experience winning the prize two years ago and what happened since then and then in the meantime celine and marta will deliberate and they'll be back with us okay so saying that i cannot wait more to hear acacia so acacia the floor is yours if you want to share your presentation and be counting three minutes the floor is yours Hello, thank you very much, Pierre. Yes, I would like to share my screen. Just give me a you second. You can. Okay. Aren't we all tired about reading headlines about child labor, air pollution, and climate change? The question is not why to act anymore. The question is how. And there is empirical data that requires us to act now, especially in the business context. 71% of worldwide emissions are a result of only 100 companies. That is alarming. Serious labor rights abuse arise in intransparent and complex supply chains of large companies. 
Because of that, new government regulations for additional ESG reporting are coming up in 2023. This is not even in six months. And now imagine, you're the CEO of a company that is affected by this regulation. You have to act now and issue an ESG report. And here you face severe problems. We interviewed 35 executives who complained that ESG management is time consuming, expensive and unstructured. But how can they tackle this problem? The how is Acacia. Acacia is a convenient data and AI driven tool that provides an ESG, a real time ESG performance ratings for companies. Acacia works in three steps. First, companies simply upload required information to Acacia's platform. Second, with the help of data analytics, a compelling ESG rating aligned with international standards will be created. There, KPIs of all three ESG dimensions are considered for a comprehensive analysis. Third, based on machine learning, companies can continuously track and improve their performance. Acacia offers a simple, fast and cost-effective way for companies to manage their ESG performance. But how does Acacia differentiate from existing competitors? There are solutions that address the problem, but those need a lot of preparation work and are very time consuming. Some solutions are rather quick, but they just focus on the environmental part of the problem. Others provide a reasonable one-time assessment, but they do not offer machine learning and real-time tracking. And this is Acacia's sweet spot, the consideration of high-speed analysis, a comprehensive ESG focus and an AI-driven assessment. The market for ESG management is still young and growing fast. European companies required to report account for an available market of 147 million euro. We assume an obtainable market about 51.5 million euro for Acacia. Acacia gains increasing traction. Our conversion rate rose up to 54%, which shows the interest of potential customers. Also, we received two letters of interest from German companies Chibo and Volvo already. And Acacia got accepted for the pre-accelerator program Gaia. Together, we strive to combine our passion and qualifications to make a significant impact for our environment and society. The question is not how to act and why to act anymore. The question is how. Wow, thank you. Five, five seconds left. Congratulations, thanks. I open to the jury for one question, please. Marta and, and Selim, if you have one question. So in, you can go if you want. Marta, go ahead. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, just a question uh, because and I don't understand totally. Uh, you born when? What is your kind of metrics if you are already in the market? What is your metrics that you have already uh, had? Can, we, can you please repeat that question, Marta? The first question is if you are already in the market or not. And if you are in the market, what is kind of metrics that you can give us? We are not yet in the market. Okay. And so the second question is probably not that you to answer. Perfect. Thank you. You're very welcome. Okay. So, Celine, do you want to say something? Or for the rest of time, we can move on. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Acacia. Let's move on to Move Easy. The floor is yours. Can you put the slides, please? Hello. Yes, I'm sharing. Yeah, put that full screen. Excellent. Can we start? Yes, thank you. Yeah, three minutes. Go. In a month, I'm going to move to another country to get a job. And I realized that I'm going, I'm looking online for a printer for the third time in the past three years. And the previous two are in my parents' garage with so many other duplicates. It need, it's needless to say that this is not very environmentally nor financially conscious. So I was thinking, what if I could actually sell the things that I bought in Lisbon to other students who are incoming master students, or maybe expects who are who are moving around other countries often. MoveEasy would enable people who are moving between countries to sell, buy, rent things, for furniture and home appliances to and from each other. And this way they could, they could choose a more sustainable solution instead of always buying a new one or trying to transport their existing one. 
Furthermore, Movizi provides a meeting point for, pe for people in the same shoes. So they are more likely to, to, because they are more likely to need similar kinds of things. And it eliminates language, technology, and infrastructure barriers. Hello, we are the Movizi team. Eli Simonov, Yunus Yurimez, and I, Judith Nemeth. Let us present you our solution. Here, you can see as a user is logging into the main page and he or she can choose the recommendations or go on browsing. Today, we are going to look for something in the living room. We are going to filter by price and products. When the user is scrolling to, through the products and finds something that might be interesting, he or she can check the product page and if or he or she is still interested, they can also check the seller's page. They can find a short introduction, reviews and comments, and they can click on the button if they actually want to buy the product. At this point, they are starting a chat where they can talk with the seller, they can agree in a date, time and location for the actual product pickup. When this point is reached, the seller will, will initiate the process to go into the next status. Here, the price of the product is going to be deducted from the, it's going to be reserved on the bank card of the buyer. And only after this, the seller and the buyer is going to receive the personal information of the other party. This enables that users are not getting the personal information of the other party unnecessarily, only when they are already talking about the actual purchase. When they actually did uh, the pickup, the application asks if it went smoothly. And if yes, afterwards, the user only has to leave the review. So let me quickly tell you about our users. They are young professionals, university students, and the environmentally conscious people. Our value proposition that it is easier, cheaper, more environmentally friendly, and more secure than other sites transporting or buying new furniture. Our, our costs are the development and maintenance costs for the website and the app and creating the company. And our revenues are going to come from commissions, fees, and ads. These are our future plans. So ask me, please, if you are interested in what are these. And sorry for running out of time. It's OK. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thanks, Judith. So questions from the jury, please. So very quick one, Judith. Thank you for the presentation. How is this different from eBay? This is different because here, the whole process is actually based on parity, because on eBay, people are usually feel like that they are going to be scammed. It, is, it doesn't feel so professional. So this time when the whole page or the whole site saw reason is that expects and uh, often moving young professionals and students can exchange their products. They can, the whole process is actually uh, created in a way that they feel secure and they actually are more secure than on eBay. And at the same time, the products are more likely to be what they are looking for. So there's a smaller, amount of products, not everything that is imaginable, but products that are needed in the cases of people who are moving often. Okay, Celine, more points? Celine, we don't hear you. You're muted, perhaps. Sorry, no, 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 I'm good. I don't know okay. if Marta has a quick, a quick question as well. Uh, my quick question is if um, what is your strategy to go to market? Uh, how can you or where do you will start? Our strategy is to start in Lisbon because we checked that there are many e-commerce users in Portugal who are mainly young and educated people. So this is why in the beginning I said that language barriers and tech, technology barriers are going to be lowered because the, our target group is mainly tech heavier and knows more languages than the average. So we would like to start with university students. We are thinking about teaming up with universities so they can uh, promote in the beginning of the year this digital solution for buying the furniture. And we were also considering partnering up with, uh, with, um, with websites who are, who are selling or where people can rent apartments because it is very logical that people who are renting apartments, they are probably going to need home appliances and furniture as well. And then we are uh, planning on the geographical extension afterwards. And we also have a few other revenue streams in mind that would uh, that could uh, scale up our idea. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Judith. For the interest of time, we're gonna to have to move to the next uh, team. So the next team is Shared Gear. Do you want to share your presentation, please? Yes, good evening, everyone. 
Hi. We're ready to share. Do you see the presentation? We see two tennis players. Is that correct? I don't know if you see also like the, the video. It should not appear. No, we don't have. No, we don't see it. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. So, good evening, evening everyone. We are Share Gear and we, uh, we aim to simplify the exchange of sport uh, gears. Uh, first of all, we started from the problems of our customers. Today, there is a lack of renting alternatives. We're starting a new sport abroad. And also, customers don't have a way to monetize over sport gears without selling them. So how customers actually are solving their problem? Uh, they're exposed to expensive rent store tariffs, and uh, they're exposed to risky investments in equipment when starting a new sport. And uh, also, the unused products are often left in canteens and garage without the possibility to monetize them. So our solution is offering access to a cheap sport gears by connecting renters with product owners in a simple two-sided C2C marketplace. On the right here, you see how our prototype that we developed with an application called Figma. And uh, here you can see the display, what is displayed to the renters when it choose the, the item. Um, actually, we have a product description and then a ranking system, both for renters and lenders that gives our customer eye transparency over uh, let's say what what is put in the in the platform. Um, our business model is uh, mainly uh, composed by three parts. So we have a revenue model, and we um, plan to charge ten percent commission fee over the single transaction, in addition uh, of a service fee for using the lockers. Our target group is composed by mainly. Uh, young people from 18 to 34 years old, uh, those are proactive people, mostly males that we validate with our uh, interviews and living in high density cities. Uh, our key activities would be uh, further developing our prototype that we already have uh, ready and uh, develop the minimum, the minimum viable product in the future. Uh, then uh, the, the next step is to collaborate with university partners and build traffic in the platform. Uh, now is really the moment to develop this opportunity because uh, um, revenues are going up both in the Portugal market and also in Germany and France. In fact, we plan to develop our uh, market starting from, uh, from uh, Portugal and then developing in the uh, most European cities like uh, Berlin, Paris, or even Madrid. Yeah. Regarding the customer development, in order to test our hypothesis about the demographics and interests of our customers, we applied the principles of validation and iteration to confirm or to, re our, to reject our assumptions. So for instance, we experimented with Instagram ads and based on the results, we indeed found that a large proportion of our target audience is actually between 18 and 34 years old. However, we also found that with 80% of the clicks, our offer appeals more to men than to women. And we take these learnings into account in the further development of our app. And in the first stage, we adjust our offer more on sports for men, such as footballs or biking. Subsequently, we will also make these adjustments in our business model canvas. Next slide. So how do we want to scale our venture in the future? Since we have a digital business model, we can scale our business with minimal costs uh, or big further investments. And the launch, after the launch of our MVP this year, we will establish partnerships. You have to close, Yannick. Yeah. Sorry? You have to close. You're done. Okay. Last, okay. Last you don't have a last slide? Um, this is the last slide. Okay. Yeah, we have our, just our team at the end. Yeah. Excellent. Sorry about cutting you, but we have to move on. Yeah. Thanks a lot, okay. Yannick. So questions from the jury. Two, two quick questions. Um, um, you know, what would be potential competition and why 10% as a commission? And, you know, how does it compare with the other type of uh, platforms of sharing? You know, it seems quite low to me. Right, I can respond to the commission fee. Uh, so basically we did some market research and we saw that Amazon, uh, eBay and uh, other businesses are uh, getting this type of commission fee. So they're around 12%. Uh, Amazon of course is having a higher commission fee because it's uh, providing a better service in terms of uh, time and uh, lead time to the customer. But actually we, so we, we are uh, in the market, I would say, because uh, on average, like the commission fee for this kind of services was around 12, 13%. Um, and sorry, can I ask you uh, another time the second question? It was... um, we do, what are the other platforms that are, we do basic, what is the competition? 
Yeah, right now uh, we uh, did some market research on Crunchbase. Uh, there is a company called Gaifang that is present only on, on, in Hong Kong. So it's the only company that right now is in the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, renting uh, business and is actually in, uh, in Asia uh, where the restrictions are really high in terms of uh, uh, geographical expansion. So we don't fear that they will come in Europe and develop the business here. And I think in terms of uh, renting application that offer this type of service, uh, the market is really empty. So we uh, basically have this uh, kind of first uh, position in the market. Um, and I think that uh, the, the the main cost, the main competitor, sorry, could be like the the uh, the ranch. Can you, shops. Can you make it quick closure, Alberto? Sorry, the time is running sorry. out. Uh, the rent, the physical ranch shops, basically our our main customers. But we are more scalability and less uh, fixed uh, costs. So I think we we have uh, this kind of uh, favorable position in the market. Okay, thank you, thank you. So uh, thanks for the questions. Thanks for the presentation. So now we're going to follow the same approach. We're going to have, um, um, I'm going to put the, um, uh, the, the persons on the, um, the breakout rooms. So here, open the breakout rooms. OK. And now we have on stage Raquel. Raquel, can you show up, please? Hi, everyone. I'm here. Can you see me? <laughs> yes. So just a little intro. Um, it's it's an emotional uh, moment at this point. Yeah, this sorry right. to Pierre, sorry to interrupt, but I don't have any invitation. You should have joined. Sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll I'll see. Assign to breakout room. Did you receive it? Yes. I think it worked. <laughs> yeah. So it's an emotional moment here. Uh, two years ago, actually, the team, Raquel and her team, they won uh, this award. And uh, then after, we worked a little bit with the center in, in Mango App. So Man uh, Raquel, thank you for being here today. I know you're very busy and you're working at uh, Build Up Labs. Can you tell us a little bit about you, your idea, and the, the, the Camino, the, the, all the, the stages that you did since the last time you won this award, please. So the floor is yours. Yes. Um, first of all, hi, everyone. And thank you so much, Pierre, for the invitation. It's, it's really great to be back here to share a bit about my journey. I already know some faces here, and I'm so sorry that you're going to have to hear the same things. Um, but I'm actually going to share my uh, screen quickly. I prepared like very simple uh, slides. Let me know if it's uh, working. Yeah. All right. Cool. So I'm gonna try to keep this very short. Um, I would. I wanted to, you know, share a bit about my journey, how I ended up at Build Up Labs, and a bit of the lessons that I learned along the way. Uh, so just very quickly about myself. I'm currently the startup happiness officer at Build Up Labs. So definitely my main goal is always, you know, helping startups, and it always has been uh, since Mango Up. Um, I love communities. That's another thing. And yeah, I love entrepreneurship ex-founder, so I already quit Mango Up. Um, I'm a mentor and I'm a scout leader. Now about my about my journey, I started uh, studying business or management at TZEC uh, some years ago. Then I had my first professional experience at Itaisi, which is a food tech startup uh, from Porto. And um, yeah, then I did my master's degree here at Catolica. So I started in 2019, I think. Um, and that's basically where it all started. So I want to tell you a tiny bit about Mango Up, about the mistakes that we did, some lessons that we learned, and how I ended up at Build Up Labs where I am today. So this was the team. Uh, this is me here. Um, then we have Nicola and Marie. So we were a very international team from Germany, Portugal, and France. And uh, we started here at Catolica at the Lean Entrepreneurship Project course with uh, Professor João. Um, and we honestly, we weren't like one of the best groups ever. We, we had a project we didn't even like at the time, um, you know, that's a secret. Um, but anyways, we ended up pivoting completely. We, we came up with the idea of Mango Up and suddenly we became super passionate about our project. And our concept was to be the first platform for student entrepreneurs. That was the first idea. This is a slide from, you know, from the, from the pitch deck at the time. And uh, we became super dedicated. And so we, I know we came up with this idea around March or February 2020. 
and by May 2020, we uh, won the Best Entrepreneurship Award uh, from the CTIE. And this was where, honestly, all opportunities kind of came up, and that's what kicked us, or kick, kick us, well, kick us off. <laughs> So we could, you know, start pursuing this project, and that's when we made the big decision of pursuing Mango Up full time. Uh, me and Marie, we still had our thesis to write. We both wrote about Mango Up, um, but that was kind of like on the side, and we were actually doing Mango Up full time. So we did it for nine months. We started in June 2020, and you know, after winning this this award, uh, Pierre, who was always there for us, uh, also opened a lot of doors for us. We were able to pitch. At a lot of events with business angels, other investors, we met, you know, Team Vieira, Indico Capital. Um, we pitched at Canopy, which is a, a community for startups as well. So we had a lot of opportunities. We met a lot of uh, cool people, and you know, we kind of were on top of the world. We felt like we could accomplish anything. Um, and and so yeah, basically, we took the summer to do research and start preparing our uh, product, and we launched around September uh, 2020. So this is just a tiny bit of you know everything we did. In the end, we did a lot because we were confused people. Um, but yeah, so this is a screenshot of our website, which is still live, by the way. Um, and this is a screenshot of the community we created. And this is a screenshot of one of the events we organized. This one was a pitch event. Um, so actually, we started with a concept more of like a social network for young founders. Uh, we actually launched it, but we quickly uh, pivoted and realized that people want to connect more than, you know, in a forum or like a Facebook uh, group where people post there. And that's why we shifted towards a community where people engage way more, um, you know, smoothly and yeah, where people have events for them so they can connect and we actually match made every single person in this community, which reached around 250 members from like all over the world. I think we were only missing one continent. Um, so very cool experience. We also created like a newsletter. Uh, we had a step-by-step -step guide. We also helped uh, the CTIE launch the first edition of the pre-acceleration program Forward, which by the way, was an amazing experience for us. Uh, we tried B2C, B2B, and all of this at the same time while we were trying to get investment um, you know, from investors. Well, as you can imagine, it didn't work out. So we, we didn't uh, find a way uh, to, to sustain ourselves financially. And that's one of the main reasons why we had to quit. Um, also because we were extremely tired uh, of working this, you know, and being rejected all the time wasn't easy either. And because we were always uh, pivoting and changing plans on top of trying to get investment, it became, you know, really, really difficult to, to continue. Um, so yeah, that's the story, I guess, like super summarized. Um, a few, like very few of the many lessons that we learned, uh, I wanted to share with you. So uh, first of all, people, people are more willing to help than we think uh, without asking for anything in return. And this was like a huge surprise to me. Uh, you should start with a simple MVP with no code tools, like don't invest all your money hiring a, an amazing programmer, you know, to start a platform that has no evidence that it's going to actually work. Uh, fundraising isn't that easy. I already mentioned this, so... Yeah, you definitely need a team with complementary skills. People always bet on the team and not just um, on the idea or the project. Track, analyze, and make decisions based on results. Um, I think we were good at tracking, but not really good at making decisions based on the on the numbers that we had. So you know, use data and use evidence to your advantage, and you know, make decisions based on that. Um, talk to people going through the same thing as you. I highly you know, recommend this one. Again, I'm a community builder. So what I do is connecting people and making sure they meet people, you know, like-minded people. Um, so yeah, and take time off. Uh, you deserve it. So this one was hard for me to, to accept because when you are working on your own startup, you feel like you have to, you know, to have that hustle culture where you work all the time, but Trust me, you need to rest. And your failures, you know, should be a badge. They, they, they don't define you. They're not your identity. And you should be proud of your failures. And that's exactly why I'm here. And I keep talking about Mango Up. It's, you know, it would be great if I was here to tell you a success story to inspire you. Um, I'm not. I'm here to tell you about my failure. But it doesn't mean you're going to fail. I'm here to help you avoid, you know, the same mistakes I did. 
Um, and how did I end up at Build Up Labs? Uh, well, Mango Up was, um, you know, again, we met a lot of investors, a lot of people at the events after winning the, the award from the CTIE. Um, and we, one of the people that we met were, was Rui Govaya. He's the CEO of Build Up Labs. And he was just starting in, or opening his startup incubator. And we decided to join because we really valued his mentorship. Um, and once we quit, I was invited by the team of Build Up Labs for me to, you know, to join and to help grow the, the incubator and really nourish the community. So, you know, 10 seconds about Build Up Labs. We are a startup studio. We started eight years ago. We basically have a team and we create our own startups. We, we create several products in parallel. So we're basically all entrepreneurs in the team. And then we have the incubator, which is where I come in and where we provide mentorship, you know, access to the network community, all that stuff uh, to startups. Um, and as you can imagine, it's a pretty good match because this is kind of what I did at Mango Up. Um, so I'm pretty happy. <laughs> um, and that's it. So I hope I was fast enough. Uh, if you'd like to keep in touch, that's the QR code to my LinkedIn. Um, I wanted to add a quick um, message here, which is, Actually, we are you know, looking to, to grow our team at the incubator. So if you think that would be something cool for you, uh, feel free to message me and we can talk about it. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Raquel. It's such a pleasure to have you back and pitching in front of, of the audience. So thanks a lot. I do appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, and the jury is back. The jury is back. So first, let me thank Raquel. So Raquel, it's a pleasure to have you back. It's good to see you again. I've seen you recently in, in your new function. So, you know, that's good. It shows and, and you know, I entered only when you were sharing some of your uh, uh, wisdom and I, can, I cannot agree more. So um, thank you for sharing your, your experience. So as, um, as you can tell, it took the jury some time to decide. It was not an easy decision. So first, congratulations to the three finalists, uh, Acacia, Move Easy and Shared Gear. Uh, we discussed and discussed and discussed, and uh, we decided that uh, the winner is uh, Move Easy. Congrats. Way. Congratulations. Congratulations to all. And, um, you know, let's, uh, let's keep in touch. And um, I hope that you can start to make it work for the next cohort of students. You know, there's a lot coming in every year. So let's try to pilot on, on our next part. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, Judy has to leave, but um, she's also very happy, I think. <laughs> and thank you again very much. So congrats, thank guys. You. Congratulations. Be... Congrats. So thank you. So we're going to close the second part of this event. Thank you to Acacia. Thank you to Move Easy and congrats. And thank you to Shared Gear. Thanks, Raquel, for being here again with us today and then we're going to move to the forward pre-accelerator program so let me share some slides with you i'd like also to thank marta marta if you're still here thanks a bunch it was a pleasure to have you here and an honor so thank you very much marta thank uh, you this is where we stand now third and uh, part of the the program forward pre-acceleration program we launched the pre-acceleration program in 2021. So this year was the second edition. And basically this pre-acceleration program came out of discussions with uh, incubators and accelerators uh, telling us that, you know, we had uh, students with brilliant ideas, et cetera, but these ideas were not uh, tested enough to go and enter directly an incubator or an accelerator. So the idea was to bridge the gap between projects coming out of the school and an incubator. So this is what we try to do. And the way we do that is we have four or five sessions from Feb to June, and we share some uh, information, but especially we expose the participants with mentors and how to pitch and et cetera. Today, what we're gonna have is we're gonna have the top three uh, projects presenting. So we did some uh, some um, some filtering of the, of the projects that were there in, in this cohort. And today we're going to have uh, four jury members. We will have Ines Sequeira. She's the founder and director of Casado Impact. Then we're going to have Jos Juan Sench. 
is the incubation manager at Demium. And we will have Pedro Teixeira, the membership manager uh, at Startup Lisboa. Okay. And what you will do, guys, so we're going to have three teams presenting today. Each team, we have three minutes to pitch, and they have three minutes Q&A. So it means two questions. Okay. And after, when you guys are done, we're going to have the winner from last year called Gluma, uh, Frederico. Will tell us about Gluma, what happened since they won last year, and where they're heading towards now. Okay. So without any further delay, and uh, first of all, thanking um, all the jury, uh, Ines, Jean, and Pedro, to be here. I'm going to call on stage for three minutes the guys from Crowdify. So the guys, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Philip from Crowdify. Uh, I hope you can hear me and see my slides right now. Yeah. That would be perfect. OK, all right. So. Um, so, hello again, I'm Philip, as I said, usually we are a team of three, but my two co-founders are sick, so it's just going to be me, but I, I think that that will be fine. So, we are Crowdify, and we democratize revenue-based financing. Uh, wait. Why are we doing this? We see challenges on the one hand for companies, in particular companies from e-commerce with subscription-based business models, stable revenues, and known unit economics and they need quick access to money to grow, but they don't want to dilute their ownership and they don't want to increase the default risk. On the other hand, we have investors, private investors like you and me, uh, which usually save for retirement or some business trips or whatever, and usually don't have big pockets so they can't invest in fancy funds like VCs, PEs and so on. And we are ready to uh, invest digitally, which is important. And those kind of investors, like you and me, I said, we need limited and moderate risk because it's our savings, it's, it's our money, and we need reasonable returns. As you see, currently, inflation is going wild, so we need to do something against it. And we need the ability to sell investment, which is liquidity, in case something unforeseen comes up. And how do we try to solve this challenge? As mentioned, by democratizing revenue-based loans. How do we do this? or well, let's say this means that we get the capital requirements from companies, we fractionalize it, break it down in parts, tokenize it on the blockchain for which we collect an issuance fee of 5%, and then sell those uh, fractions, loan fractions from company to investor or from investor to investor on our platform for which we collect a one to 2% royalty fee, which is both completely in the benchmark and common practice in the market. And in the third step, the company pays back the loan plus interest as a share of their revenues after a certain time. The advantage for the companies is that they get quick access to capital, no need for banks. They have no dilution because it's a loan, it's debt capital, and they do not increase the default risk because it's revenue based. For the investors, on the other hand, the risk is limited to the default of the company, which is okay-ish. You usually get high returns, benchmark of 1.6%, per month or around 20% per year, which is insane and helps to tackle inflation. And you have like high liquidity because you can sell your, your fractionized loans in the secondary market. What is our competitive advantage? We usually have a great team if not everyone is sick. Uh, we are already quite connected in German VC system, uh, ecosystem with VCs and founders, strong background, blah, blah. Uh, but the most important thing, the timing, current market downturn needs or drives startups to need loans and also investors to tackle inflation, as I said, and do new investments. Our next steps will be to finish the no-code MEP and then to go to market. Thank you very much for listening and let's democratize revenue-based financing together. For all your questions, we also brought some deep dive slides and now I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Philip. Excellent. So the jury, Celine, Inés, João, Pedro, the floor is yours. Pierre, for the sake of time and given that I've been, you know, involved in other juries, I'm going to leave the floor to my colleagues. Okay, thank you. Seems fair. So Inez, Juan, and Pedro. Yeah, I have two questions for you guys. Uh, so uh, thank you for the presentation. So two questions. One of all, um, which is the layer that you are using or the technology behind uh, the use that you are uh, doing to the platform? And uh, the second one, uh, which, is, which are your advantages uh, for the platforms that uh, 
do a similar thing, uh, but doesn't focus just on a specific uh, market and open the tokenization uh, for a more broader market uh, of, of, of the person that can invest on it. Okay, so first of all, um, I'm not a blockchain expert on the team, but yes, uh, as, as far as I can say, is we're using the Cardano blockchain and using smart contracts to, uh, as, as basically, like, sorry, I can't hear you. I think you're muted now. No, no, no. Yeah. So the second question from, from my side was uh, for uh, the part of uh, the advantages that you have for the ones and the platforms that are more broader in terms of public that they go and get for uh, the part of uh, the exchange of the tokens uh, per the investment. So I think uh, our value proposition does not come from blockchain. It comes from the democratization of revenue-based finance, as I'm saying, which means that you take this usually very uh, restricted financial measure of uh, revenue-based financing and open it up for public investors. And the blockchain is just the means to an end in this case, if that answers your question. Yeah, okay. I recommend you also to check, for example, interest protocol because they are uh, developing in the same spot as, as you and it would be good for you to check some, some part of it yes. uh, and to give it uh, feedback for this part as well. But thank okay. you. Uh, for sure, but uh, if I might just quickly add something, yeah, yeah, yeah. we we did some we did some like ballpark market sizing, and I think that's not a winner takes it all market. So um, for sure, thank you very much for the hint. Are we going to look at it? But just a quick um, yeah side note, I think the the market is big enough for for a couple of players in that for space. sure, for sure, for sure, for sure. Thank, thank you. you, Pedro. One more question, Ines or Juan. What's in it? I was wrong. Yeah. Well, okay. Um, yeah, Philip, congratulations. A good pitch. I saw you and I wasn't meant to read you. So happy with your progress, always. Um, my, my question goes into the calculations. Um, you connect your Shopify, then you calculate the, the money they receive on loans and the, the money or the percentage on the interest. I'm interested on what do you do? What is your benchmark? in terms of the algorithm that you use to populate these, these prices or these values, uh, because this is a business by itself to calculate these numbers based on, on Shopify accounts and so on. And I'm, I'm interested to see what, what is your algorithm behind it. Yes. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you for mentoring us. It was a great help. As you can see, we took all your advice and tried to, tried to put it in. Um, to answer your question, we are thinking about doing a factor model. Uh, to, to start okay. off with an MVP, what we're going to use is an approach like uh, we have the risk-free rate, the space rate, and then we add uh, the components specific for the, for the company, which is, for example, cash flows in the past, uh, few, uh, forecasted growth and, and things like that. And uh, we haven't finalized this yet, but um, it will be something along those lines. Uh, we just need to run the numbers still to 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 have some uh, prototyping um and and, okay. and yeah calculate the loans bottom line okay i have many questions but i'm gonna leave time for any as well <laughs> uh if you yeah okay. uh, feel free to reach okay. out after this uh, yeah, after this event course. and then we can discuss it happy happy to to discuss and uh, brainstorm thank you Nish, thanks a lot do you want to ask a question uh, just one question uh congrats uh, for your solution uh what, what are your competitors? What, you, what kind of solutions are you looking at to, to, to show uh, that yours is better? I, I, for example, in Casa of Impact, have one that I think Cooperity that's, that's a little bit like, it's not exactly like yours, but has some resemblance. And uh, what are you looking for in Germany or even in Portugal ecosystem that can be your competitor? Okay, so first of all, I think uh, we, thanks for your question. And uh, I, I think we, we defined a little bit of a niche, uh, which is this growth early stage debt investment. Um, as you can see, the, the equity space is very occupied, um, but I think one of our closest competitors in terms of let's say industry or sector is actually p2p loans so we 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 look at yeah things like um ox money which is i think a german player i'm not quite sure and things like that um 
which we first of all want to differentiate from uh, with our special uh, yeah solution and on the other hand side if we look close at revenue based financing it's usually limited to funds uh, like uh, vc funds uh, pe funds hedge funds etc which do this uh, type of revenue based financing um so it's behind closed door let's say and we want to open this up i hope this could answer your question um, thank you okay okay thank you very much so we have to move on thanks philip for the presentation thank you. thanks ines joan and pedro for the question so gaia can you come on stage and share your wisdom with us please yes hey guys thank you for having us I'm gonna share my screen you have three minutes some you... accounts now so hey guys we're gaia academy and we're lisbon student impact community so our generation is living in the middle of a climate crisis and we do face climate anxiety each and every day and some of us actually want to change something about it, but we figured out that creating impact is not as easy as we expected it to be. Why? Because we miss guidance, we miss people from different backgrounds, and we do not have enough knowledge about sustainability. So we found a solution to work towards that. What we're doing is we have different channels that you can see here, starting with a Discord channel to connect people from all different backgrounds, a platform, then having webinars and talks about sustainability to educate ourselves, and last but not least, and really important, having workshops and pre-accelerator programs about impact so that we can actually engage and create something. So um, this is our team. We're all Lisbon-based. We're from different backgrounds. We tried to find our own impact solutions. We have figured out that it's really hard, and we looked for community like that we couldn't find it so this is why we founded it um why us i think i already explained that and another important factor is that we are students ourselves and we can really understand what other students want and need um, and we are very intrinsically motivated because we felt the pain before so um how is our revenue model looking like um as you you can see we do have different revenue channels um, starting with a main partner that will be visible on social media and our website have access to all events we have figured out that companies do need impact talent because if they don't shift into sustainability right now in 10 years they will probably not be on the market anymore um, so this is our main partner the second challenge is that companies are invited to come and host workshops and that's where, we'll, where they will pay 500 euros but therefore they will have face-to-face -face contact with those impact talents for a day. And then we also have the network members that will get access to our platform and they can engage digitally. Um, so we started our whole program seven months ago. We started with the design jam. So it was a one day event where we got design students and business students working together. We created a digital community. We have more than 600 members now. We launched a big event with 150 people in Nucleo. We had workshops and talks about sustainability. And right now we're in the middle of our pre-accelerator program, completely focused on impact. We're giving impact workshops. We have amazing mentors and partners. And yeah, tomorrow we'll have our own demo day. So um, these are our partners that are all um, helping us and supporting us to actually make this happen. And what makes us different from all the other entrepreneurship programs that already exist is first of all, we're student and early stage focused. And secondly, we're solely focused on impact. Um, so right now we would really need the thousand euros um, prize money because we want to make this pre-accelerator even better and our next events even better. And in the future, we want to build up our platform. Um, expand our whole program to the webinars and in the end scale worldwide because companies worldwide need impact talent. So yeah, we're Gaia Academy and we're an impact community. Thank you so much. Thanks. Three minutes on the dot. Thank you very much. Then we're going to pass on to the jury. Uh, Celine, Inés, Juan, Pedro, if you have any questions, the floor is yours. Uh, Hi. Hi. Uh, congrats, Olivia. I didn't get one thing. Your, uh, your public are mainly students or are, are, are also companies? I didn't understand the, what are you focused on? Because you, you, you show the ecosystem. So there's MAIS, there's Impact Hub, there's Casa do Impacto. What are you different or in the, if the public that you are trying to get is different from the public that are in this ecosystem already. 
Yeah, our main target is students. So we figured to select for students. The partners are helping us to go into the EPO impact ecosystem, which is really important. And then the people who pay for it, which is also another base, um, are companies that need impact talent. So we have those three layers. We have the impact company, we have the companies that need impact, they're paying for our service. Then we have the students, they're in need of a community and get out of their anxiety and actually do something. And then we have the whole ecosystem, which we try to make our partners and just connect with everyone because it's very supportive. Sorry, my, my I didn't have the song. Uh, the students, you are linking with universities directly or you are trying to get the students like in social networks and stuff like that? Um, different stuff. We definitely have our social media. We did our own road shows. We, I think we had calls with 40 professors from all different universities. Um, Isaac Catolica, Nova, everything. So we went to the different universities. We had pitches in front of the students. We told them, hey, we're an external organization and we want to merge everyone here. Um, yeah, so we, we are definitely also cooperating with universities. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Irinesh, next question. João, Pedro, do you have any questions? Celine, do you have questions? João, hey, please. Maybe I, side now. I, 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 yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, well, I, I was amazed with your progress. Congrats on that. You did amazing stuff. Already workshops in a lot of communities. I think the challenge here, and Ines touched a little bit on that, is really differentiate for, for the ones. I, I really want to understand what is the core value proposition for companies and what type of companies. Can you give me an actual example of one that have this need for impact um, talent. Can you give me that example? Let's take either Shell or Heidelberg Cement, like the biggest cement company that um, is responsible for 8% of the CO2 emissions worldwide. And they're under such huge pressure to actually change their business models to get innovation on board. And they're really looking for smart people that could once be on the sea levels and, and yeah, change their business ASAP. Okay. Yeah. But are you trying to, are you trying to, to create this platform that will be, um, I don't know, sourcing this talent to be entrepreneurs and change that actually uh, affecting, so, no? Um, we, we're trying to definitely give them the entrepreneurial mindset. And if they want to create ideas, especially like the pre-accelerator program is awesome for that. But what we try to do is like give them the skills and just enable them, show them that they are powerful enough to actually change something so that they can either make their own ideas and create something or they go into companies with their entrepreneurial spirit and yeah and, and change something okay okay got it thank you you're welcome pedro do you have a quick question uh, no 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 go for it go for it no i don't have questions i don't have no questions. No, no 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 from my side then okay celine no okay so Thank you, guys. We're going to go to um, the last presentation of the day. And Thanks. the last presentation, I would like to call uh, on stage Leonard for, uh, from Whisper. Leonard, the floor is yours. So you can share your slides and the wisdom and all together. Thank you so much. First and foremost, hey, everybody. Great picture so far. So congrats to everybody. Let's see how this one goes. Um, I'm going to share my screen right now. And I'm ready to go if you are. All right, everybody, would you like a cookie? Sorry, don't really feel like giving it to you. This is what every company in the world is facing right now. Just like my joke, it's not that funny. Right now, digital ad sale because it has become much harder and more expensive to meet the right target audience online. No cookies mean less personalization. Creating engaging content is a major bottleneck for every company. And in the end, an ad is an ad and will always be perceived as less trustworthy than word of mouth. At the same time, on social media, we see that people share their experiences all the time, especially when it comes to showing off their favorite activity or restaurant. Our mission is to turn these happy customers into brand ambassadors. The process that we envision couldn't be any easier. Customers go on an activity, for instance, a bungee jump. Of course, they take a nice reel or TikTok of that and share this on their socials. All they now have to do is tag the provider, tag Whisper, and upload the receipt in the Whisper app. And voila, just like that, they get a cashback on their purchase. Just to reiterate, 
customers only have to use the Whisper app to upload the invoice. We then take the best social media for content and integrate this into Whisper to create a best of all recommendations. The benefit for customers is pretty clear, get rewarded for something they do anyways. But with this approach, we also have companies break the bubble because we leverage the trust, the organic reach and the creativity of millions of users and their network to help companies succeed. So not only does this approach take a huge burden off of companies' minds, but also their wallets. With recent Google Insights data, we predict to significantly lower the cost per mill. And all these savings hit an immensely fast growing market. The sum in Germany alone is at 2.1 billion euros and the tendency is fast growing. And of course, we're gonna capitalize on that, right? Um, as a marketing intermediary, we receive a commission from partners for every verified purchase. They also pay monthly servicing and a one-time onboarding fee to us. But the true beauty, in this dark, cookie-less world, we generate boatloads of first-party data that we can bundle into insights to share with our partners. And this is just the top of many, 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 many more monetization models waiting for us. Wrapping this up, please think of the last time you booked a trip trying to find cool activities to do. Was it pleasant? Um, we're breaking into a market with only two verticals because we focus on experiences. It's either saving money or finding cool things to do. And especially for the latter, there's a massively underserved customer basis that relies on recommendations. Whisper combines these verticals to create value on both ends of the spectrum. So not only do we think it's a great idea, we're also the perfect team to make it happen. Jan has heaps of experience in building startups and designing apps. Dion is a very seasoned IT guy that has coded iOS apps for the past 10 years and I'm gaining insights into the business and marketing side of things at Google right now. And together, we're going on a journey to turn brands into friends. Are you in? Congrats, just on the dot again. So, congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Leonard. Thanks for the presentation and sorry about the cookies. So, uh, <laughs> Pedro, do you want oh, to start? Yeah, 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 I can do it. So, I, I wouldn't uh, like to, to know, um, on this part, uh, if you have it, or if you don't have it uh, yet, no problem. If you, if you don't have it, it's uh, normally the beginning. But uh, if you have, like, uh, if I would ask you if your strategy for the long term would for you to go with it or to put it in a big social media network uh, and say, let's go uh, use it. So if it is B2B or B2C directed? Uh, it's B2B to C. So I think we highlighted the value to both the customers and the um, businesses. So it's obviously a two-sided marketplace, right? And we act as an intermediary in that instance. And the way I see it is we will run with the idea, build the app. Jan is an amazing coder that has uh, worked with Leon. They already built a couple of apps together and they're very good at what they do. So uh, childhood friends of mine. And the idea is to get this thing going. There's uh, heaps of other competitors in the market this is really taken off. It's called social commerce, but they're all focused on fashion and fashion is not the right market in my mind. And I think the idea will come into fruition one way or another. And so I think we would build something like that, take off and then maybe get bought out by TikTok, Google, whatever. So that would be, that would be a possibility. Cool. Thank you. No worries. Thanks. Next question. Can I, can I go? Um, Leonard, uh, great pitch, congrats. Um, get great energy and great pitch uh, overall. Uh, what do you need, Leonard, to, to go this forward? Um, validation, validation for real. Um, so I think Jan is uh, very capable. He can build an MVP in no time. That's pretty easy. Uh, biggest bottleneck would be to get the social media content into our own app, but there are APIs for that. Um, he's very capable. so. An MVP would be re relatively easy to build, but we wouldn't do this without validation from investors, I would say, because Leon is uh, work, working full time and I am pretty keen on my job right now as well. So uh, we would probably go to investors, try to get some money in, and this would leverage our work as validation for us to really commit to this full time. Okay, are you based in the, the Germany? You both uh, three? I'm in, du I'm in Dublin right now and my guys are in Germany. Okay, we talk later again, Leonard. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Joan. Celine or Inej, Inej or Celine, do you have any questions? I don't have it. 
Okay. Thanks, Inesh. Thank you. So okay, let's... Then, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do, I, do you have time for one more question? Very quick Some, question. It has to be very quick. Very quick. Okay. Okay. Just, just, just one thing. Uh, are you a social media? Your vision is to be a social media, but people gain cash back? Um, we're not a social media app. We're not a social media app. So the charm yeah. is that people don't have to share on Whisper. They share on their own sources. So, so that's a huge, way that we, huge obstacle that we don't have. Uh, we're not a social media app. We just take the best content and curate this. So basically, we'll, we will be the next Google Maps, basically, for that. Uh, so people will go to a new city. I'm in this position right now. I have to reach out to people that I can trust that recommend, like, cool restaurants for me or activities to do because using everybody uses Google Maps for that, I think. And it's not a great way to go about it. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So I just assigned the jury to the breakout rooms so they can discuss together. And I would not like to be a jury member because it's gonna be difficult to choose. So good luck guys. Um, and I would like to call on stage uh, Frederico. Frederic, are you with us here? Yes, I am. Hello, everyone. Uh, great to see you again, Pierre. Uh, it's a pleasure, Frederic. So the floor is also, yours. It's also a pleasure for me to, to be here uh, presenting Gloomer. Congratulations to all the projects. Uh, they are all amazing. Good luck to everyone. Um, maybe I'll start uh, by talking a, li a little bit about Luma and then uh, uh, I'll speak about uh, our experience uh, in forward. Let me just share my PowerPoint. Can you see it? Okay. So, uh, as you already know, uh, our, uh, our name is Luma, and we want to detect breast cancer at an early stage. But first, let me start by sharing with you the story that inspired us. This is Philippa, and she had breast cancer. She used to do the breast self-exam, but however, she didn't have the self-confidence to do it. So when she felt something in her breast, she thought it was nothing. Three months later, the lump didn't disappear, and she went to the doctor. The result? malignant cancer and mandatory breast removal. But as Philippa, there are thousands of women who don't have confidence doing the breast self-exam, don't know how to do it, or just simply forget to do it. And that's why 37% of women of breast cancer, sorry, are not detected at an early stage. So we created a solution. The, this is the Sense Glove. And it's a home and portable medical screening device that complements the breast self-exam. This device, it's, complement, uh, it's uh, connected to a mobile app. Um, and with the help of piezoelectric sensors, it will detect and control abnormalities in the breast tissue. Um, this will be possible because uh, we connect our glove to a mobile app that will have a machine learning algorithm, uh, which allow us to detect any difference in the breast. Our mobile app will also remind women to do this screening exam. This is just a complement, so it doesn't replace at all the diagnosis exams or routine appointments. And fourth, we simplify results. And if the glove detects something, the app will send an alert and recommend women to schedule an appointment. And the economical impact of the early stage detection is already prove, proved. In IPO, a Portuguese oncological hospital, it is spent twice as much on late detected breast cancers compared to those that are detected uh, at an early stage. And an American study shows that we can save about $1.5 billion with early detection of breast cancer. However, and more important that the economical impact is the psychological impact. It's the aggressive treatments and mutilating surgeries that can be avoided and the lives that can be saved when you act at the right time. And of course we have competition, but with different technologies that have many limitations. Our glove is the, uh, it's the only device that can detect every abnormality in every woman, and we can reach women with a much lower cost. So this is where we start uh, our first difference. Uh, when we were um, at, uh, at Forward, uh, we haven't started our clinical trials, uh, which we have already started in January of this year, 
with proof descobertas. Uh, we finished our proof of concept with 90% accuracy uh, for abnormalities detection uh, in 40 patients with 80 data points. Each woman get us uh, two data points because they have two breasts, that's obvious. Uh, and we are going to start our clinical study uh, with 500 patients in all of these hospitals. So we have been working with them. Uh, we will be working with them. We have already submitted um, uh, the documents for the ethics committee and to start um, the second stage of our clinical trials. Other difference that uh, Pierre de Berezier can already see, it's our team. So uh, we are a team of, uh, at the moment, we are a team of four. Uh, we have Francisco, is Gluma's co-founder, uh, and Filipe Cousin, and he's a biomedical engineer. So he has not only the motivation, but also the technical expertise to do this. Normally, Francisco does the pitch and uh, is much better than me. Um, he was the one who assisted uh, and talk with Pierre when was uh, when he was uh, teaching us um, how to pitch, uh, and thanks to the way Francisco pitches, we have had the luck to win uh, some prizes. The the second member it's me, uh, so I I am the other co-founder, and I've joined Francisco with my knowledge in management and digital innovation. Uh, we have Guillermo, he's our infrastructure specialist, uh, and we, we count um, with the help of a te te textile factory called DC Factory and a hardware development company uh, for, for the product development, which is 3D Ways. Tomás is our data spe specialist, and we have IPN, uh, a, Portuguese, um, a Portuguese institute helping us in regulatory affairs. Uh, and we already have Cecilia on our team to work with the regulatory approvals. EPN is also a partnership that came from Forward uh, Mentoring, which is, uh, we still have that, uh, that partnership uh, after a year uh, of participating in Forward, which is amazing. And we have extended uh, our group of uh, advisors and uh, our uh, uh, scientific team. So, we have our medical advisor, Dr. Rogelio Luna, is the, um, is the Spanish Association, uh, is the president of the Spanish, uh, Spanish Association of Breast Surgeons. Uh, and we also count uh, with numerous advisors, uh, business and strategy and scientific advisors. Uh, our network of doctors are the principal investigators of each hospital. We have then other investigators that are working in them for the clinical trials. Some more differences uh, that we can see uh, since we participated in Forward. As you can see, we have changed a little bit our image of the product. Uh, on the left, you have uh, the prototype we had when we finished Forward. I don't know if you can see my camera, but here is how the product is going right now. So we are working on the product development. Uh, it's been, it's been a big headache and uh, it has given a lot of work. Um, we have, uh, as you've seen, uh, you, we changed the, a little bit the team. We have grown also. Uh, we have already changed the, the, business, the business model since then. Uh, we have this different idea for the product, which is, uh, we had the medical device as the glove and the mobile app as the complement uh, of the medical device. Now uh, we see as the medical device all the systems. So we have the glove, we have the, the mobile app and the, the machine learning algorithm. Uh, we defined our pathway as a medical device. So um, we know that we are a class 2A in Europe and Australia. We are a class 2 in the USA and class 1 in, in United Kingdom. Um, we are going to start as soon as possible. We have been working to start on the uh, on the on the regulations with Cecilia uh, to start to write the documents. Uh, we have grown uh, our our partnerships uh, of hospitals. So um, at the moment, we were talking with uh, uh, Santa Maria Hospital, one of the biggest hospitals in Lisbon. Uh, right now, we have Kuf, we have the Amadora Sintra Hospital, we have Barreiro Hospital, uh, Santarém Hospital, and we have been talk 
talking with the regional health system of Madeira. So um, a lot of things has changed uh, since we started forward. Uh, even before forward, uh, we have less things that, uh, uh, that when we, we finished because uh, we were we were we were only starting uh, our our startup journey and forward uh, was amazing because it gave us the tools for the beginning of this journey then a lot of partnerships came up with this pre acceleration program for example with casa do impacto dimio uh, startup praga uh, as i already mentioned um instituto pedro nunes uh, so a lot of amazing people a lot of amazing uh, partnerships that have been helping us through uh, this path um, since we since we reached here, um, and basically it has been an uh, it was an amazing experience for me and Francisco. It was the beginning of everything, uh, and thanks to that um, we are where where we are now. We normally uh, finish uh, the pitch with uh, our catchphrase, so. Uh, we know there's a pain, we have the team, the solution, the support of hospitals, doctors and cancer associations. So join us because at Luma, we cannot stop breast cancer, but we can help women stop dying from it. I don't know if Inez or, or João are already here and Celine. It's great to see you all again. Uh, I can just give a word. I already talked the benefits that we took from, from forward. Uh, but I will also want to to recommend to everyone that uh, uh, that is here. Uh, so, sorry, Pedro, I, I can't talk by experience about Startup Lisboa, uh, but I can uh, talk uh, that Dimio, uh, it's a great tool to get uh, early financing uh, and to, to grow and uh, to give those steps until the, you get the, the investment. And Casa do Impact, it's, uh, it has a lot of uh, projects. We participated in Rise for Impact. Uh, you have several other uh, programs that you can apply that can help you grow and can uh, give you resources uh, to, to, to grow and scale uh, the best you can. And having always in mind the, um, the, the metrics uh, around uh, impact. So. It, it has been uh, great experiences that came up from forward. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Frederico. Thanks for your time. Thanks for being here. I know you're very busy. The thing perhaps I, I, we would love to know is you've been able to get some funding. Can you share with us the value of the funding you've been able to raise? Yes, uh, we have. Uh, we are missing to, to Demio uh, regarding that subject. Uh, we had a proposal from Demio uh, around uh, Around uh, of 100,000 uh, euros. Uh, we are just we haven't closed it yet because first uh, we have we are full of work and we are waiting for another proposal from a business angel to put the um, the, the investments all together. Um, regarding uh, prices, not funding, uh, we have won some prizes in May. We finished, as I said, the Rise for Impact program of Casa do Impact. Uh, fortunately, we we won uh, the first prize. Uh, it was an amazing growing tool for us. It's uh, it's a long uh, it's a long program. We started in October. Mm -hmm. uh, we had the acceleration program until uh, December, and then we had the incubation program from January to May. Uh, we were always followed uh, by a mentor. Uh, between October and December, we were actually two mentors. Uh, which gave us a lot of uh, amazing inputs, feedback, uh, helped us to grow a lot. Um, so we have also that, that experience besides the, the DMU experience. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Frederico. So the, You're the, welcome. The jury is back. Uh, I'll pass on the, the mic to um, Celine. Celine? Hello. Uh, so yes, the jury is back. Before we announce the winner, I want to say hello and welcome back to Federico. It was, it was, you know, I couldn't hear because you know clearly we were busy on the other side. But it's good, it's good to see you again. You know, it's, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm proud to see you grow. And uh, you know, as I've said for other projects before, it's a great honor for us 
that you know it started very young with us. So you know, as a university, we see our role as uh, you know helping pe helping people and supporting people to grow. And you know that's what we we've done in, in in this thing. And you've grown really really well. So congratulations, you you made us proud. Thank you. Well done. <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, uh, I already thank Pierre, but also uh, also thank you for the opportunity to to hear be here sharing uh, my experience. I can also say that uh, actually um, I finished my executive masters in Catholic in February. Then we started uh, right away the the program in February uh, last year. Uh, so we started right away the pre-acceleration forward program. So it, it was a, a great compliment to the, the executive masters. So it, it was an amazing experience to after the, that program participate in this with Francisco and then be growing uh, since then. Well Thank done, you. well done. You know, busy, busy times. That's good. That's a good sign. So, uh, you know, clearly the the three uh, finalists want to hear more. Uh, it took us some time. It was not an easy decision, but after long, long discussions, we want to uh, give the award to Cratify. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, highly appreciated. But I think, uh, first of all, uh, also Gaia and uh, Whisper, amazing teams and great work. So I think we all deserve it. Uh, however, I'm very happy to take it at the end of the day. So uh, thank you very, very much. Um, I'm going to call my sick teammates immediately and tell them uh, the great so Congratulations to Thanks you. To congratulations guys. to the all three teams. You know, you were shortlisted out of uh, a much larger number of teams. So, you know, uh, congratulations for making it to that stage. And uh, congratulations for to Cratify for making it. So, you know. You know, we're counting on you to come and, and present next year. You know how it works, right? Thank you very much. We're looking forward to that. Maybe in full size and shape then. I hope so. Thanks a lot. So Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much to all. Uh, Cratify, you are going to be in touch with you. Gaia and Whisper, the center is still here to help you out to reach uh, the milestone you want to reach. So you can contact us after and we're going to do office hours and and the work that we've been doing before. So you can do that and you're welcome to do it. And um, I think Celine now, if you want perhaps to, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the jury. So Inesh, thank you for coming with us today from San Pedro de Alcantara, uh, Joan from uh, Saldanha and Pedro from Rua da Prata. So it was a nice journey. Thank you for being here. Again, it's a lot of, uh, I'm getting a little bit emotional to have seen Gluma today and uh, seeing Crad, uh, Cradify. I think it's super nice. So thank you guys for participating, sharing your time with us and impacting the ecosystem here. So congrats. Celine, the floor is yours. Thanks. So just to, you know, just to close, um, it's been, a, um, um, I mean, a, a journey. I cannot say long journey, but it's been a journey. And it's always uh, amazing to see, again, people grow in, in this journey. So first I want to thank Pierre for the dedication, the hard work, and uh, organizing everything, you know, the mentors, uh, the juries, uh, you know, as you know, the guys who, I mean, and, and you you guys have seen it all, right? There was lots of people involved at multiple multiple steps, you know, um, this is, you know, there's, there's a lot of logistics and not only that involved. So thank you, Pierre, and congratulations for, for, for the result. Um, I want to thank very much the jury, you know, we could not have done it without you and, and for the, the ones who were involved earlier on, thank you for your support, you know, along, along the way in this, uh, this whole process. Uh, to the three finalists, congratulations for making it, to all the teams that, that were involved from the beginning, you know, uh, well done, uh, keep up the good work, uh, let's continue growing and, uh, you know, thank you everybody and we see you again next year for more uh, adventures. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care, guys.